Hey everybody, I'm Aaron Newcomb. Welcome back to the channel. On this episode, it's part two of my effort to take a look at this Canon uh, part printer, part laptop. On the last episode, we took a look and got the uh, windows to work, figured out that there was an issue with the display. Still not sure what's causing that, but the printer didn't work. And so today I'm gonna take this laptop apart, see if I can figure out if there's anything wrong with it, fix as much as possible, and hopefully get the printer working. So let's take a look at it right now on the Retro Hack Shack. In a previous video, I took a look at this Canon NoteJet 2 laptop, which had a built-in printer. This was pretty ingenious for the time, especially for those people who needed to print documents out on the road. However, it had a couple of issues. The laptop screen took forever to actually warm up and display something. Some people in the comments suggested that this could be due to bad capacitors, and so I want to take a look at that. Also, the printer itself wasn't working. Whenever I would turn it on, it would just spike up the amperage, uh, which makes me believe that there's probably a short somewhere. In fact, I think this may have blown a fuse somewhere inside because after a while it stopped spiking up the amperage at all and the printer just wouldn't work. So I want to take this apart and see if I can figure out if there's any bad capacitors or other parts, perhaps bad motors, that might be causing this spike in amperage, causing the printer not to work. So there were some people in the comments uh, who commented on the fact that I had drilled out one of these connectors to make it big enough to fit on the laptop power supply. But that was just a temporary measure because I couldn't find the right size. And I mentioned I was going to replace that with a proper one in the future. Other people recommended that I get a, uh, a laptop power supply kind of thing. And I have something like that. Um, this is from China. I like it because it is adjustable. I can adjust the, the voltage up and down. One thing I can't do with this though is I can't adjust the amperage. And so that's why I'm using, that's why I was using my benchtop power supply where I could limit the amperage. This one will theoretically go right up to the maximum rated, which is five amps before something blows a fuse or something. This one's rated for nine to 24 volts at five amps. It does come in quite handy to test out laptops that I think are probably working but I just don't have the right uh, power power supply for it. Rest assured, I did go out and buy some more um, of these adapters, and then I bought some more of those adapters, and then I bought some more of those adapters. And you can see here, I should have uh, just about anything that I would need now, especially if it's a barrel jack. This one that's green, I don't know if you can see that, but this one that's green and this one here, I think, um, would both be the type that would fit on that three millimeter uh, uh, power jack that was on the back of the laptop. And then, of course, after I bought all this and was happy to see that I would definitely have one that would fit, Lo and behold, I cleaned out one of my drawers and I found yet another uh, set of adapters. And this one would also would have worked, the green one there. So I guess if I would have looked hard enough, I could have found one that would have worked. But now I've got pretty much all the standard ones. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and take this laptop apart. So I started by removing all of the screws that held the chassis together, including these somewhat hidden screws that were underneath the keyboard in the paper tray. Because this laptop was made in conjunction with IBM, removing the hard drive was as simple as opening up the compartment and then pulling on this little tab that pulled the hard drive out easily. After that, I was able to separate the two halves of the laptop Unfortunately, when I looked inside, I knew this was not going to be as easy as I hoped. Laptops from this era already were complicated enough with system boards, daughter boards, power supply boards, all sandwiched together to make the laptop work. In this case, though, we're dealing with a printer as well, and that means there was a lot of connections that had to be made from the main board back to the printer components. And this was done with flat flex cables, in this case about 10 of them that I had to remove before I could pull the two halves apart. And with only a few inches separating the two halves of the laptop, so it's not an easy process. 
but with a little patience, I managed to get everything removed and I could open up the laptop and get my first peek at what makes this laptop tick. And right away, I could see a problem that I hadn't anticipated since the laptop was working. So unfortunately, there's a lot of glare here, but upon opening up, there's a couple of things I found right away. Uh, one is this corrosion that's happening. But the odd thing is there's no capacitors near this area and the battery's not even really too close to this area. So it's not impossible, but it's odd. This might just be spillage, hopefully. Maybe somebody spilled something in there, but that's the first thing. The other thing that I found right away was this uh, little piece of cushioning, which I guess was probably, you know, maybe over here at some point glued down, but that had fallen into uh, where the gears are. And so what could have been happening is, you know, this little motor here, I'll have to take a look at it, but it could have been that, you know, when I powered this thing on, the motor was trying to spin, but it couldn't because of the, uh, uh, because this little thing was wedged in there and that could have burnt out the motor. So we could have a bad motor here. The other area I want to take a look at is here. I believe because of the big caps over here, this is most likely the power supply area. So I want to take a look at these caps and see if any of them are leaking. It doesn't look like it at first glance, but a lot of these smaller electrolytics can be deceiving. So uh, the surface mount one. So I'm going to be taking a look at that, see if I can find any that uh, potentially are leaking or could be bad. So I first turned my attention to this area of corrosion, which I cleaned off with some isopropyl alcohol and a lot of scrubbing, and then used some vinegar to neutralize any of the remaining acid that might be present there. Uh, then I cleaned it again with more isopropyl alcohol. And one thing after I got done, even though there was this big hole left in this uh, grounding shield here, luckily there was some plastic right underneath the grounding shield that kept the corrosion from going down into the mainboard of the laptop, which would have been a disaster. There's no way this laptop would have booted up if that had happened. Next, I need to replace some batteries. There are two batteries that I found that were completely dead. One is this lithium battery that was visible from the memory compartment. And then I found another one completely by surprise. It's this yellow battery, uh, which was over here by the main battery, apparently plugging into the printer board. So perhaps that has something to do with the printer errors I was getting. Not sure, but I'm gonna replace it. This is a nickel cadmium battery. However, uh, I really didn't have any information about this one. All I could find was what was on the wrapper, which wasn't much. It just said nickel cadmium, no voltage, no model number, no nothing. So I had to do a bit of research on what these batteries were and how to find a replacement. The reason I'm replacing these batteries is because some of these older PCs and laptops, especially the laptops, just simply will not boot if they don't have a good battery attached, if it doesn't sense good battery voltage. Sometimes you have to take the batteries out completely to get them to boot. Sometimes you have to put a good battery, a known good battery in there or rewire it so that it thinks there's a good battery. It just all depends on how the logic is configured. Uh, so it took quite a bit of digging to find out what these batteries were. I noticed that they were roughly the same size as a AAA battery and that led me down a path. So these are actually one third AAA. These are nickel cadmium, but you can also get them in what I'm going to be replacing them with, which is these nickel metal hydride batteries. In general, you can simply swap out nickel metal hydride batteries for something that uses nickel cadmium. Um, the only problem is these batteries were spot welded with some strips here. And of course, these batteries don't have that. So I'm going to be um, soldering instead of, I don't have a spot welder, so I'm going to be soldering these batteries. And you need to be careful when you do that, especially with lithium-based batteries, as you, if you get those too hot, they can blow up. Just be really careful. That's why when I got this lithium battery, I got it with these tabs already soldered. And I can work with those tabs and solder onto those tabs very quickly without fear of heating up the battery too much. Um, but these uh, nickel metal hydride batteries, I'm going to have to solder these. And the way I'm going to do it is with very high heat on the soldering iron. I'll get it up to about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, check for Celsius down below. What I've been doing is I've been practicing with some of these old AA batteries that I'm getting ready to recycle and just making sure that I can get a spot of solder on the battery ends very, very quickly with that high temperature range. You don't want to leave it on for more than a couple of seconds, which is why we're using that high heat. 
Um, but that high heat will allow me to get a little spot of solder on. And then I also bought these nickel battery strips, which you'd used with, you know, some, some of the newer, larger, uh, 18650 batteries like this. If you were going to, uh, build a big battery pack out of these, you would use these nickel strips for that. Um, but I'm just going to be cutting these down to size and using them to solder these together in the correct configuration. And by the way, I did test these existing batteries and they are completely dead. So even though I had the laptop running for some time, the, neither of these batteries are taking a charge at this point. And if you're wondering, uh, the date code on this lithium battery is 1994. I guess that's either the, the ninth week or maybe that's September. Not sure. Uh, 1994. So 25 year old, 27 year old battery. The next thing I've done is I've uh, configured the batteries the way that I need to uh, connect the strips, and then I've just taped the battery together so it'll hold its shape. One last thing I'm doing is I'm applying a little bit of solder to a very clean, make sure you clean this off with a sponge before you do this, uh, a clean soldering tip, and I'm applying a little bit of solder. Solder will transfer the heat as well as that big tip. So a little bit of solder on the soldering iron will help transfer that, that uh, heat quickly into the tip of the battery. Uh, again, just trying to avoid heat buildup in the battery itself and keeping it only on the tip of the battery. And just that quick, I don't know, maybe that took a, a second and a half, hopefully not more than a couple of seconds to get that solder down on there. Whew. And you can see I wasn't too careful because my uh, this 800 degree iron melted or started to melt the uh, anti-static mat a bit, and that kind of stinks when you do that. <laughs> okay, so now I've got a little bit of solder on the ends of my nickel strip and solder on the battery ends, and so this should go on very, very quickly, melt together. Okay, not the cleanest job, but the batteries aren't very hot. They're just warm to the touch, and even the even the tops at this point have already cooled down, so they're they're not really that warm. And that's what you want when you're doing these batteries. Let's take a look at the boards that are left over and see what I think is going on. Of course, I don't have a schematic, so I don't know for sure, but I think that this is the main um, board, the main laptop board, the computer part of the laptop. You know, we've got most likely the, the, I believe this is the CPU, which was, is, is labeled from both Intel and IBM over here. And then a video chip over here. There's uh, way over here. There's a chip that controls the, um, uh, PCM CIA slots. So, you know, I've been able to look up some of these chips and this is basically the main computer part here on this board. Um, and then we've got this smaller board, which is looks like it's the power supply components for the computer, is, is what I'm thinking this is anyway, because I can see some coils, some larger caps uh, there as well. So I'm guessing that's what that is. And then last but not least, there's this board, which has a big Canon chip on it. So I'm assuming that this is, is what's controlling the printer. This is the printer logic um, printer controller, and it has some bigger caps. So it looks like it has its own integrated power supply. There's some sort of a big uh, transistor here or, um, you know, uh, a voltage regulator or something. So, so this board here, I believe controls the printer. Now I've gone over all of these with, uh, not with a magnifying glass, but with a certainly a close look up to my face, uh, just to see if I could find anything that's blown specifically on this board, because the way the amperage was acting and then, you know, where it, it would spike up and then reset the computer. And then after a while it stopped doing that. I'm worried that something blew. I don't think a broken capacitor would cause that. Although these capacitors are old, we'll get to that in a minute. But something on this board, I think, has has blown or shorted. It could be in any one of these chips. I'm not going to be able to troubleshoot necessarily. You know, I'm not going to be replacing this Canon chip, for example, right? So if I can't fix it with something fairly straightforward, I think I'm just going to going to call it quits uh, based on my level of expertise. So one thing that's curious about this board is it has a fuse right here, and it says seven amps, uh, 125 volts. So this is like the main. Um, uh, power 
fuse, I'm guessing. And we can test that and just see if that's has been blown or not. So putting my uh, meter in continuity mode. Nope. That is definitely, that fuse is just fine. But I'm also noticing that there's these smaller, what looks like fuses here, because they have an amperage rating on them. Uh, there's uh, two there, surface mount components. There's one over here, and then there's one over here. And I want to test each of those to make sure that those uh, are not open. They should be closed. Fuses should allow electricity to flow through unless you've overdone it and blown them. So let's test those. Yeah, I'm getting nothing from this one, actually. That might be a problem. So maybe I can find a replacement fuse for this. Maybe that's the issue, but it's probably not the root issue. Usually blown fuses mean that there's a problem somewhere else that was shorted or whatever, and this is just the protection. So perhaps, perhaps replacing this would fix the issue, but it's probably masking some other problem, like, you know, a shorted, uh, connection in one of these big ICs that I'm never really going to be able to troubleshoot effectively without, uh, you know, having a schematic or really knowing what these chips do and everything. I I'm not sure it's worth spending days and days to figure that out. But uh, yeah, so there's one issue right there. Let's take a look at these caps. So I'm going to be checking all of these electrolytic caps, uh, even the ones that are SMD. Uh, there's no SMD ones here, but there are certainly some SMD caps here on this power board. I'm going to be testing all of these for a couple of things. One, I can test them with my meter, which measures capacitance, but that doesn't always give you an indication of what's going on. I will also be testing them with my ESR meter. So my ESR meter will actually test... Um, to see if the capacities are actually good. This was a fairly cheap meter on eBay. And if you're gonna be doing this type of work, I've probably said this again, it's worth investing in at least a cheap meter that does ESR. You can get meters that are LCR meters that will test uh, inductance, capacitance, and resistance. And some of them have an ESR function built in. But this was about 50 bucks on eBay, I think. It's got a little guide with some of the typical values that you should see. Um, let me show you how I use this if, uh, if you're interested in diagnosing some of these capacitors. Now, this particular meter even says, it tells you what frequency it uses to test, but it even says in-circuit tester. So the idea behind this is that you should be able to do in-circuit testing, but I can tell you it's only reliable, um, you know, certain percentage of the time, maybe 50% of the time in my experience so far. Um, so sometimes you can test stuff in circuit, but what you can do is you can definitely get a indication of whether a capacitor is good or bad. You may not get an absolute value, but you can at least get an indication while it's in circuit of whether it's good or bad. And then if it tests outside the range, then you can say, okay, you know, these two capacitors tested outside of range. Let's pull those two out instead of pulling every capacitor out. Let's just pull those two out and test them out of circuit. And then you'll get the accurate reading. Now what I've done is I've connected two little leads to the ends because these wires aren't very long. And I think the length of these connections actually does matter for accuracy. But I've connected two little leads to these so that I can get in here and test these surface mount caps, which are a little bit hard to do with just the clip leads. It's, it's way too, things are way too close together to actually be able to do that. I can get down here on either side of this surface mount cap surface mount electrolytic cap, and then I can measure it and it'll give me a reading, in this case, 6.83. And it even tells me that's good if the capacitance is greater than 10 microfarad, uh, referenced at 25 volts. That's also important. I'm not going to go into all the details with ESR in this episode. Just wanted to show you this little tip about putting some leads on here. It works pretty well. Now for these through hole electrolytic capacitors, I can most of the time, you need to find out which side is positive, which side is negative. Of course, the one with the stripe is negative, most of the time anyway. Um, so I can clip my positive lead on the underside of the board there. Sometimes you can get a good clip. Sometimes it's more difficult. I think I've got it there. And then I can just touch this end to the other side, and it should give us a reading, 1.58 ohms. So this 47 microfarad cap is reading 280 in circuit, just to give you an idea of what it would read in the meter, which is going to be inaccurate. And the ESR meter is reading 4.77 in circuit. But let's go ahead and since the other one wouldn't come out, let's pull this one out and we can read what those values actually are for real out when you pull it out of the circuit. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see this on camera, actually. But in here, if I move this back and forth, I'm seeing some 
maybe some wet electrolytics that came out of this when I heated up the leads. So maybe these caps are a bit of a problem. Looks like something's moving in there. Okay, let's get it out and see for sure. Okay, I went ahead and snipped this one off and sure enough, uh, there is wet goo uh, underneath, which leaked out when I heated it up with the soldering iron. And there's some here too. So I have no idea what this is gonna read outside of the circuit, but I'm glad I ordered replacements because these are definitely old and it's very smelly. So from a capacitance standpoint, I mean, this is definitely out of spec, not far though, 54 microfarad. So even with that leaky electrolytic juice, it's still close to spec, but let's see what the ESR meter tells us. And sure enough, the ESR meter says that this cap is only good if the capacitance is less than 4.7 microfarad. So given that this is supposed to be a 47 microfarad cap, this cap is definitely out of spec and needs to be replaced. In fact, you can see I had the same problem with pretty much all the electrolytic caps on this power supply board. So I went ahead and replaced all of the caps and I cleaned off the board thoroughly to get all the electrolytic crap off the board. Okay, I've turned on the fan because it's getting pretty hot here. Maybe it's hot where you live as well. Uh, so I apologize for some background noise. Penny's in here uh, trying to figure out what she's gonna do. Hopefully not get into all my stuff. Can you sit? Penny, can you sit? Can you shake? Oh, good girl. High five. Oh, good girl. There you go. There you go. Good girl. Now don't get into trouble. Well, I had this open. I wanted to take a look at these stepper motors because I was afraid that maybe there was a short and that was causing that big ramp up in amperage that I saw before. So there's two stepper motors that I can find. There's one up on this end and there's one down here. And I'm assuming that one of them controls the paper feed and hopefully the other controls the uh, motion of the cartridge back and forth. Stepper motors, uh, what I've learned uh, on the internet of all places, is that they're not very hard to test, especially these simple four pin stepper motors. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring in my meter and turn it on to resistance. Now there's two windings in stepper motors and those windings are um, exposed on these four pins. So essentially you have two windings and they should be about the same uh, resistance level on both of them. The only trick is you need to find the two pins that go together. So um, let's see, let's pick, uh, let's, which motor should we start with? Let me start with this motor because I think I can zoom in on that a little bit better. Okay, this is a very small stepper motor. So, you, so I've had to zoom in pretty close, but here it is right here. And so uh, I can kind of probe around. You see there's four pins here on this motor and I can just pick two at random. This will only register when I get the two motors that are actually, you know, the two pins that actually correspond with that winding. So like if I, if I measure these and I get zero, then, you know, that's probably okay. That's probably okay. Okay, there we go. So this is 30 ohms and that's on these two pins. So the other two pins must be the opposite winding. And if I measure those, it should be something similar, the resistance. Yeah, 30 ohms. So this particular motor has not shorted out. This particular motor is good. So I've tested the other motor and it tests good too. Now there's another test that you can do if you um, uh, don't have a meter or don't have a meter with you at that, at that point, but you do happen to have an LED, you can actually see if the motor is generating any electricity at all when it's rotated. Now, uh, I have tested both of these motors and I can rotate this gear here and I can see that the motor is rotating. So it's not definitely not stuck. And if I do this carefully, maybe you can see if I put the ends of this. Now, when you let me just say when you have a normal stepper motor and it will usually have some ribbon or, or wires coming off of it and it makes it much easier to test. In this case, I just have the pins exposed. Everything else goes through this flat flex somewhere. So it's kind of hard to do. Normally this would be easier. What I can do is I can just put this LED, I don't think it really matters which, which way I do it, as long as I can get the pins to, to, to touch. And if I rotate the gear, well, I've got the, um, well, I've got the LED on the windings. We should see the LED light up if the winding is good. So let's just try it. Yep. Can see the LED lights up as I rotate the motor around. So that was one winding. And then if I put it on the other winding, there we go. 
So hopefully you could see that. So this is also uh, uh, fine. Both windings are fine. And that's the way you can test a stepper motor with just an LED. Now I need to turn my attention to this corner that broke off. Um, and there were some suggestions online about how to fix this. I am going to use some super glue or cyano, cyano acrylate some glue. I think is how you say that. Acrylate, cyano acrylate. Anyway, super glue. I'm going to use that. Um, some people suggested I use that with some baking powder or baking soda. Can't remember which one you use for that technique. Um, if I needed to fill in gaps, but I actually don't need to. It'll, it's actually going to go right back on the way it came off. So what I'm going to do is use the super glue to get this bonded. And then I'm going to use some two part epoxy um, to just kind of drip down along the edges here, uh, which will just give it some more support. Okay, well, it's been about 15 minutes and the uh, epoxy is now very hard. This was a 50 or a five minute epoxy, but it looks so like it's pretty strong. I'm just moving it a little bit and it's moving the whole frame um, of the laptop as opposed to moving the joint where I glued it. Problem is I was just going to pick this up and turn it over and it is stuck to the mat. So I'm just going to twist it a little bit. Hopefully that will get it off without breaking. Wow, it's really on there. There we go. Uh, it took off a little bit of the little bit of the uh, plastic. It looks like. Mm. Okay, not bad. Let's zoom in on that. So there we go. Some of the super glue actually leaked through. I probably overdid it a bit. But that's okay. It's going to be better than it was, and it's going to be stronger now when I screw this back together. So not great, but eh, not bad. Okay, so I think I've done pretty much all I can at this point for this laptop. I have uh, replaced capacitors on the uh, power supply, tested pretty much all the other capacitors, um, I've taken a look at the stepper motors, which seem to be working, and I've also cleared some debris. Um, I've got the batteries working again with fresh new batteries. I've cleaned up some corrosion, uh, tested transistors. I mean, pretty much everything that I could think of, uh, I've done. Um, I'm not too sure it's going to be enough, though, for a few reasons. Number one, I still can't get the carriage to move. Now, that could be on a mechanism that opens up. When, when the gears do their thing and I just can't seem to trigger it somehow. I also found a random spring, a small spring that was just sitting in here. That doesn't bode well uh, for things. And then also I found this, let me get out my tweezers. So after playing a little, little bit of the operation game here, I found this sitting on the inside of the, uh, <laughs> of the printer area here. It's a tiny heart. So if there was ever any indication that this printer was not going to work when I put it together, it's the fact that I found a heart inside the printer. <laughs> it's like the heart is broken. It's just given up. It's not going to work. For me at this point, if I can just get it back together, um, have the computer working well and maybe have a five or 10% chance of the printer working, I will be satisfied at that. So now it's time to actually put all these pieces and parts back together. Keep my fingers crossed and hopefully this thing will actually boot up again.
Well, I was able to get it back together with just a few extra pieces. There's a washer, this little spring that came from someplace, and then there's this piece to a switch, which I honestly can't figure out where it goes. I've checked all the switches. They all seem to work. So somewhere on the inside, maybe it's the suspend resume. No, that works. Somewhere there's a, there's a switch that has a broken slider, but I can't for the life of me figure out where it is. So we're going to see if it'll work without that. Everything is put back together. The screws are in. So I'm going to hit the power and turn it on, see if the, at least the computer works. Right now the printer is off. So let's just see what happens. Okay, so I should be on the screen with with the time, asking me to set the time. So at least it got this far. I'm gonna have to wait and give it a minute for this screen to warm up before I can uh, see if it's actually working. All right, well, this is still warming up. I can at least see the numbers now. Uh, like I said last time, if you remember, it took like 20 minutes for it to get to a place where I could actually see it. So hopefully you can see this somewhat on the screen. What I wanna do first is I just wanna test those battery updates I did by setting the date to something else besides the default and then resetting it and see if the date remains. So I'm just gonna do that. And then I am going to restart. Oh, that's right, because I, I set it not to start into Windows, I forgot. So I gotta do Win to get it to go to Windows. And there we go. It's, uh, yeah, this will get better as the display warms up. But hopefully you can see Windows is there and the color is coming on as it warms up. So that's at least a good sign. Okay, now let's go into date and time and see what it thinks the date is. Yeah, one one twenty one. So now the battery is saving the date and time. So that's a good sign. At least that'll last for a while now. I'm just glad that the computer part is working. <laughs> Whether the printer part is working, I don't know. We'll find out. All right, time to do the deed, I guess. I am not expecting this to work at all because I couldn't get the carriage to move um, unless it was just those motors that couldn't turn and it was drawing too much amperage and, and blew that fuse. I've got this set back down to two amps again, and we'll see what happens when I turn this on. But keep your eye over here on this bottom indicator, which is the amperage. I expect this is gonna do exactly what it did before and spike and make the computer restart. Um, the only way to test it is to actually do it. Like I said, I don't expect it to work, but I'm going to turn the printer on. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay, I'm turning that off. So yeah, it's doing the exact same thing. As soon as I turn the printer on, it spikes up the amperage. I don't hear any noise coming out of the uh, um, stepper motors at all. So... Yeah, there's something that's just drawing too much current. I don't know what it is. I don't know why this isn't working. Uh, and I just, at this point, I'm just happy that the laptop is working. I really, really wanted to get this working. So maybe that fuse is okay. I don't know what's going on at this point. The printer is definitely not working. I'm almost positive it's probably a, a shorted transistor somewhere, but there's hundreds of transistors in there. Well, maybe not hundreds. But somewhere between 50 and 100 transistors in there, and I just, I'm just i not going to go through and troubleshoot it all. So that's too bad. I'll keep my eye out. Perhaps I can find one of these that is working, and I can show off the printer functionality in a future video. For now, I'm going to call this one done. Well, sometimes things just don't go to plan, unfortunately. In this case, uh, I was able to definitely fix some things that weren't 100% quite right. Uh, that corrosion, the capacitors, those were definitely problems with this laptop. But at the end of the day, they really didn't help fix the printer problem that much. And I just don't have enough time to to spend on it, you know, without and still put out episodes every week or every other week. So I've had to leave the project here for now. I'll put the laptop in the garage and maybe come back to it at a later point when I have enough energy to tackle that printer problem, because it'll probably require a complete disassembly and, like I said, testing a lot, a lot of transistors to see where the problem is. You know, even though I couldn't get the printer working, this was still a great learning experience. I learned a lot about how the laptops from this particular era were put together. 
uh, I learned a little bit about the uh, stepper motors and how to test those, and I shared that with you. So there's always something to be learned. It's never a lost cause. And so I feel really good, even though I couldn't get the printer work working. Uh, speaking of problems, uh, you may have noticed in this episode that the audio quality was off in some sections, and that's because I lost my main audio feed from my lavalier mic, which produces pretty good audio like this. And I had to rely on the backup audio from my shotgun mic on the camera, which isn't that great and picks up a whole lot of stuff. So I had to do a lot of filtering anyway. Apologize for the poor quality audio, but at least I was able to get the episode out. If you like the episode or the part one in this series and you want to support the channel, you can like this particular episode, subscribe to the channel, and most importantly, sign up to become a patron. I'm starting to do some uh, Q&A now with patron members, and patron members also get early access to my videos from time to time. If I ever have ads, they'll get ad-free access as well as your name in the credits. So with that, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash retrohackshack and sign up. End of line.